everyone that's ever driven a car at some point didn't know how to do it. You know, it, everyone had to learn sometime and, um, and nobody was, um, call him a cray out of the box. Welcome to the Motorsports and Driver Development Show. I'm Katie. I'm Keto. And today we are joined by Brianne Korn, who I'm not even going to try and introduce. I'm going to let her do it herself. Brianne, please tell everyone who you are, where you're from, and what you do. I'm Brianne Korn. I live in, technically, I guess I live in Maxwell, Texas. And I actually live at uh, Lone Star Rallycross. And I have a shop here, and we work on Subarus and Miatas and almost anything else, apparently. Uh, we, uh, we do some private driver training here and we, uh, prepare some, some cars and, uh, we have our own rally cross series and, uh, we have a small fleet of rental cars and, uh, that's the other thing I forgot to tell you about. Um, we do have rentals. So I have six cars now, three Miatas and three Subarus, and I'm trying to get up to where I have 10 matching Subarus so we can do like corporate events and things like that. Oh, excellent. Awesome. Excellent. And then, um, and so, and I do a couple other things. I have a, a small photography business and I've shot for hot rod magazine and stuff like that. So. Awesome. And so we know you from the rally cross world, I think, right? right? Yes. Okay. We know you from the rally cross world, but you have done many other things besides that. How did you even get into racing? Like, what was your first foray? Well, my, golly, it goes kind of back to like 15 years ago in Italy in the summer of 2004. Uh, and I had a moment in the mountains in a rental car with my friends. And I kind of, kind of, I call it my epiphany. And I said, well, if you won the lottery, and I have to go back and say that I kind of for a long time, time thought that that my family not having any money was the reason I didn't get to do any of the things I like to do and then one day I figured out that I was the reason and uh <laughs> and uh and so I asked myself if I won the lottery I could do anything and I I decided I that the answer was that I would be a rally driver and I said well screw the lottery figure out how to do it and so when I got home from Italy I looked into it and I'm like yeah that's kind of expensive and then I always um, kind of tried to live by the mantra that um, the opportunity favors the prepared. And so I so well, how can I start driving any way I can, even though I don't have any money? And I started doing autocross and convinced my brother to do it in his car, in his Honda Del Slow. And, <laughs> uh, uh, and so that's how it all started. And I did a couple of autocross driving schools and bought a Mini Cooper and then I was off to the races. So when you were dual driving with your brother, were you beating him? And uh, he beat me the first three races. And then it took him about 11 years to beat me again. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> was the, were those uh, first three races motivating for you to uh, beat him for the next 11 years? Um, no, no. I mean, I, if he was, if he was beating me, I don't think that I would have, you know, I wanted, just wanted to be the best that I could be. And right. if someone else was beating me, then I, I probably wasn't being the best I could be. You know, I, uh, I just tried to do everything that I could. And, um, you know, he used to get a little upset that I would beat him. And I'm like, well, you know, you just show up and you're pretty much as fast as me. And I've like put my whole life into this and, you know, so mm -hmm. maybe you should be nicer to yourself. <laughs> were you practicing when you weren't racing? Um, I think the statute of limitations has passed in that, so I can say yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is a don't try this at home moment. Don't try this at home moment. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, the, the Mini Cooper was driven like a race car every time the motor started. And, uh, uh, it was a beautiful, beautiful car. And, uh, the, the warranty was 50,000 miles and I sold it with 50,001 miles. Oh, good for okay. you. <laughs> so how did you transition to dirt? Well, that's where I wanted to go. I mean, that was the ultimate end game. And um, 
Uh, somewhere in there, I bought a $400 Impreza off of Craigslist. And it was an automatic sedan. And I brought it home and I stripped it down and I did the liquid nitrogen and I was started buying Subarus off of Craigslist that were broken. And then I'd fix them and I'd keep all the little race car parts and I'd make them stock and sell them for more money. And then all the little race car parts went on my rally car. And I guess it took me about, so it was 04 and then 11 plus so like 20, the very, very end of 2010, I finished the car and I raced, was in my first rally in 100 Acre Wood in 2011. Oh. And, um, and so then I- built a stage car. I built a stage car. Cause there was no rally cross. I didn't even know rally cross existed. Okay. And, um, and years later I found out that the last rally cross in Texas happened almost at the exact same time I started doing, I started autocross. Oh. And so it like, we were two ships in the night. We just completely passed and never saw each other. So um, did your brother co-drive for you? No, I got a, uh, a co-driver that had um, gone to, is it Ken Blot's co-driver, Alex? Uh, he'd gone to a co-driver school at Tim O'Neill's place mm -hmm. and was a local in Texas. And I forget how we connected, probably through one of, one of the forums. Probably, um, man, it's been so long since I've been on a forum. I don't remember what they are anymore. Right. It's one of the early rally forums, mm -hmm. and we connected to that, and then he was my co-driver for everything. Oh, and wow. um, he was with me in 100 Acre Wood, and um, we, uh, um, he went with me to WRC Mexico and everything. Did you race WRC Mexico? I did. You did? Yes, in my in my homemade six thousand dollar Impreza. What? And, when was this? Uh, twenty twelve. It's pretty. I don't know if you can see the sign in the back. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that came from. Right. I have so many questions. How do you? So, so you built the hold on. So you, you built the car <laughs> to FIA specs then? No, they um, they they had a thing because they were piggybacking on the Rally Mexico local rally. And so they had a class called Rally America. Uh -huh. Oh, and you could come show up with your rule book and they would tech you to your rule book. Oh. And, um, but, uh, that was super interesting. It was a lot of fun and, um, probably wow. one of the coolest things I've ever done in my life. <laughs> yeah. Funny. That is, that's pretty but awesome. Yeah, I, I, pulled, I got pulled, I pulled up onto the little platter and it rotates you around as they introduced <laughs> you and it was all live on national television in Mexico. And so like all week long, people would like come up to me at restaurants and say, oh, I saw you on TV, we're big fans. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> were there any other female drivers? I don't remember. I mean, there um, are not many. I don't, I don't, um, like we were... We were on group. There was no others in our, in the Rally America group, I don't think. That so, is amazing. And you could just sign up. Yeah, you could just sign up, show up. We uh, mm -hmm. literally drove from here to Mexico with a race car in the trailer and drove all the way down to Leon. And, um, wow. But it was weird because the tracking system, we had to do a $7,000 deposit for their tracking system oh, that they mount in the car. Yeah. yeah. It was funny because the tracking system was worth more than my car. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and when you got to return it and get your deposit back, you were probably like, okay. Yes. Jason, Jason, my boyfriend at the time, was very happy to get his deposit back. <laughs> <laughs> Smart to not pay that yourself. That is so cool. Do you want a chance to brag about the results? Like, did you do great? Well, um, I mean. He was first in class. <laughs> I, was, I was winning my class until... Uh -oh. Um, and that was where my rally car died and <laughs> there was about a 70 mile an hour, uh, somersault and ripped all its arms and legs off. Oh. And, um, so yeah, but it was really, really fun. Did you, um, did and if you, you if you actually Google Briancorn, Mexico, it's like a 15 second clip 
and then make sure you listen at the very end and you hear what I say. And I would like to think that, um, that it would be a, um, a good way to describe me, you oh, know, um, okay. and maybe even an epitaph at some point. Okay. Yeah. Oh, speaking of epitaphs, I actually think your memoir should be titled, It All Started When I Bought a $400 Subaru Off of Craigslist. For real? <laughs> wow. Oh, man. Okay. So did, did the car ever make it back from Mexico, or did you just leave? No, no, it's here. It's sitting out in the, out in the field waiting. Sorry, there's some um, dogs. That's fine. Oh, oh man, that's wow. awesome. Okay, so um, you're talking a lot about cars. What about motorcycles? Well, motorcycles was my first love. Oh. And probably when I started all this, I, I actually raced Pikes Peak twice on a motorcycle mm -hmm. uh, before I took a car up because it was cheaper. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to go before they paved it. So it was really important to me to do Pikes Peak. So it was still half dirt. And so I'm like, well, I have this motorcycle. And my friend was um, up there crewing and called me. He's like, you should be here. You could totally, um, you should totally do this. And so I was there the next year with my motorcycle was 16 years older than the next oldest motorcycle in my class. Oh my gosh. Oh. And um, so what and kind they of bike was it? It was an XR 600R, okay. like a 91 XR 600R, and um, that I completely built myself so that I would know what to do with it, and um, um, that was a, that was a lot of fun. That, that was my first wheel-to-wheel -wheel motorcycle race ever was Pikes Peak. I'm sorry, that's wheel to wheel? Well, if you catch the person it, in front It of you. was. No, no. When I did it, they started you five at a time like a drag oh. race. Oh. And they painted a little white box, and the flagman was this, like, 85-year-old guy, and he'd been doing it since the beginning. And um, and he would, he would step – he had to be in the box when he waved the flag. So he'd step into the box and out of the box and into the box and try to catch – make sure nobody, like, tried to – get the jump and then he'd step in the box and leave the flag and everybody would take off. And so you could be elbow to elbow fighting for line going up Pike's Peak. Wow. Wow. Unpaved and, um, peak. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So when, by the time you got to the unpaved area, was it still sort of handlebar to handlebar, wheel to wheel? Was um, not, not for me on my motorcycle. <laughs> 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 um, I did get to start next to uh, Malcolm Smith, uh -huh. and he won, I think, the first 10 Baja 1000s on a motorcycle. Yeah. And so he was in his 70s, mm -hmm. and uh, he and I were right next to each other in the dirt or on the paved part. And then you go to dirt, and then you go back to paved, so it was kind of back and forth. But mm -hmm. when we hit the dirt, he just checked out and left me, and uh -huh. um, it was beautiful to watch. Huh. <laughs> wow. That is so cool. So and scary. you've also done Bonneville on a motorcycle. Yes, I did Bonneville uh, in a Lakester, in a 600 horsepower Lakester, trying to go 200 miles an hour mm -hmm. and broken axle going 165. Oh. And, uh, and so then the car left and we were hanging out and somebody said, hey, we heard on the radio someone needs a rider for his, his motorcycle. And, um, so we walked over and he's like, yeah, I'll be back at six o'clock in the morning. And I went out and set a record the next morning, came out and backed it up and did it on my mom's birthday. So I got to, you know, world record for you on your birthday, mom. And that was so, cool. so what kind of motorcycle and what was the record? <laughs> the record was 88 miles an hour. Right. And it was on a 1948 blown gas, partially streamlined vintage, 500 cc. So it was a 1948 Triumph, and it technically it had actually been ridden by Burt Monroe, who was the world's fastest Indian mm -hmm. in the 60s. Um, the guy that owned Isky Cams, it was his motorcycle, and he would let him borrow it to ride run errands in LA. Interesting, really. Okay. Yeah. 
So it was super weird. I had everything was borrowed except for my helmet, borrowed gloves, borrowed suit, borrowed boots, borrowed bike, and uh, just standing there available. And uh, it was pretty cool. That is so cool. I would like to take a moment and ask you if there's anything you're afraid of, just generally in life, spider. I think I know you like spiders, but. Um, I've seen you handle a bee before, so I would like to know where your fear threshold is. That's a good question. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I'm not sure. Um, I, I, um, I worked through a lot of them. So, I mean, I, I, I guess probably my, my one fear that I, that I had to like actually resolve, uh, was fear heights. Mm. And so at church camp one summer, I was on a 600 foot cliff and I got so mad at myself cause I'm like 20 feet from the cliff and I'm just shaking and I don't want nothing to do with it. And I just got super mad and I took my shoes and socks off and I marched over to the side and I curled my toes over the edge of the cliff and I stared there and stared down at the ground below until I stopped shaking and then I was fine. And that was more or less how I've confronted most of my fears. Okay, wow. great. Right. Wow. I, I, my heart is racing a tiny bit. Fine. Um, okay, let's circle back to Rallycross. You said you mentioned you were like ships in the night and Rallycross ended right when you kind of got into racing. Are you responsible for bringing Rallycross back in Texas? Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, <laughs> Did you just like hear that it existed and you're like, oh, I should bring that back? Um, well, I wanted to do Global Rallycross when it came and there was an almost sponsored ride with Honda and GRC and they had a car in Colorado and I even went to Colorado and got test fit to the car and they were building the car to fit me and, and it just all kind of, the person putting together um, just didn't quite put it together. So they even took me to the Indy race in Dallas and I met Simon Paginaw and hung out in the Honda trailer with them because he was supposed to be my teammate and uh, and it just didn't happen. And um, I have a lot of those, it almost happened but didn't happen stories. Mm-hmm. And, um, but uh, I, 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 I designed my track to be a practice track for that. Mm-hmm. And so, and at the time you had to drive, you know, hundred acre wood was the closest rally. And I, um, I just wanted to do this. And so I started building the track and I started a little Facebook page and all of a sudden people started gathering on. And then one day this guy's like, can I put on a race there? And I'm like, I hadn't really thought of that, but okay. <laughs> and so we did that for a little while, and, and then we had some disagreements over what the value of my time was, and uh, we parted ways. And then Kevin, my brother, stepped up and took it, and he ordered all the timing equipment, and he made it. I mean, I was – that whole adventure kind of – I had a depressive moment mm-hmm. or four, and my brother kind of carried it and – it would have died right there if he hadn't picked it up. Yeah. So, but now he's he's working. He does movie stuff. He does special effects for movies. Oh. And he, worked, he worked on Alita. He worked on Fear of the Walking Dead. He's working on a Amazon show now. And and so now, um, my world has kind of come full circle, and I'm probably in the best place I've been in my entire adult life. Nice. You know? And okay. um, and so I have all. I'm here. I quit a job of 17 years and I've been doing this full time for two years now. And, um, and on my time on the tractor and on the grader on the track is probably my, some of my most precious time. I call it, it's my meditation. And actually call it, I call it a Zen, a Zen garden for race cars. Oh, it totally is. <laughs> so do you spend more time on the tractor or in a race car? Oh, way more time on the tractor. Way, way, way. And I, and I'm, it's so important to me that the surface is good when we have a race and it's nice for everybody. And I, I want 
any car to be able to show up and run and not, not be damaged. And so, um, like I won't even drive on my own track. Like I've been home here. My track is 50 yards that way. And I've only done two laps on it in four or five, five weeks or more. Um, I don't want to tear it up. I don't want to tear it up. Aww. And, um, and so I'm getting it all groomed and super perfect. So the first race we do when the world comes back to normal, so it's going to be so nice. Yeah. <gasps> yeah. You know, I have to pull keto off the tractor sometimes before a race. Cause he's the same. And I'll be like, Oh, it's good. We got to go eat dinner. Like we got to go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you want to make it. Oh, and everybody knows when it, when I'm tractoring and the people want to like, can we go to dinner? I'm like dark plus 30 minutes. <laughs> that's all you gotta know <laughs> yeah Man. when the sun goes down i'll get off the tractor so why is the hardest thing for you about running rally cross organizing it oh the weather absolutely 110 percent weather 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 wait but you guys have way different weather problems than we do what are the things that cause you heartache we have we have droughts which cause dust storms and silt beds 18 inches deep and we have floods that create gorges and gullies and um but part of the last year and a half i have um kind of evolved my my track grooming philosophy okay and now we don't hold water anymore and um i'm doing a lot of earth moving to um uh, further aid and and being able to have all weather events mm -hmm. so the, the ultimate goal is to have the track set up so that no matter what we can run rain or shine mm -hmm. and um so yeah. but yeah weather's for me weather is the hardest thing mm -hmm. yeah it's the one that breaks my heart more than any other mm -hmm. yeah we feel you on that i run our timing so i end up sitting out in the rain and so I'm not even worried about the track. I'm worried about myself. I'm going to melt flour. <laughs> well, we have, um, I, I, I have, um, a 1985 Volkswagen Westfalia camper uh -huh. van. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's our timing booth. Oh, nice. Okay. So everybody sits, they sit on the couch with the table <laughs> and so they can see everything. And, um, and so all the timings run from inside this little Volkswagen van. Nice. I want a Westfalia. That's a good one. <laughs> Um, so you have instructed at our events when we do driver training in cooperation with a race uh -huh. and we have gotten some of the best feedback about your style of instruction, the things people have learned from you. I want to know, like, what are you channeling when you get in a car with someone and you're trying to just instill a little bit of something in them? What are you channeling? What are you trying to get in their head? I, well, what I want to get, what I'm trying to get into their head is for them to get out of their head. It depends on what I, what I get a feel from my student. Like I try to take everyone individually. And so I, I find that, that really, really intelligent people have a really hard time being in the moment. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of my work with someone like that is trying to get them to, to be in the moment, do all of your, your real deep contemplation in front of and behind it and then just be there, but also be in control. You know, then you have people that are super emotional. And so then you're maybe trying to get them to be a little less in the moment. Um, but if everything, the, 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 the root of everything is for someone to feel comfortable and feel like they're in a place where they're not going to get hurt. And they're not going to um, be made to feel like they've done something stupid. Mm -hmm. um, because everyone that's ever driven a car, at some point, didn't know how to do it. You know? It, everyone had to learn sometime. And, um, and nobody was um, calling McCray out of the box, you know? So... Um, Really just trying to make sure that everyone feels really comfortable and know that I'm not going to judge you uh, on any level, you know, like it's okay. It's a, it's, we're probably in your car. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and in most of the environments that we're in, uh, we're never doing anything that 
where I feel like my, my personal self is in any kind of jeopardy. And, um, and with those two things out of the way, it's just all about making people comfortable mm -hmm. and then understanding that, that where you think the limit is, that's, that's not it. It's way, way out there. And there's a whole bunch of good, um, life metaphors there. Um, you know, when I, when I started autocrossing, I'd go out and I'd drive, I'd make a lap and I'd come in. I'm like, you couldn't do better than that. And then I go, I always made sure I rode with all the fastest people and I always watched the fastest people. And, um, and I'd go ride with someone and I come back and I'm like, Oh, okay. I have some work to do, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and then you'd start figuring out what the difference was and, and try to try to make it up. So. Mm -hmm. So you had one piece of advice for her and it sounded like that was a lot of advice for newer drivers, but like a more advanced driver and you had some advice to give them. What, what would you say generally speaking? Um, I mean, probably the look ahead is probably still, um, I mean, if we're talking about Raleigh cross Pacific, um, uh, I'd say that the one thing that most people don't do is, is course memorization. Mm -hmm. And, um, and not only when I'm in a, in a, in a very serious environment, if I'm on a national level environment, I'm, I'm not just memorizing the course. I'm memorizing where I want to be looking at each point on the course. Mm -hmm. Cause I memorize my look ahead points mm -hmm. and, um, in uh, uh, autocross school, we call them uh, key cones. No. And so there's just a handful of cones that really mean anything on, mm -hmm. on a, on autocross or rallycross course. And the rest are just kind of there to confuse you. And, mm -hmm. um, uh, and so those, those would probably be the main ones. Um, some people have a, have a really hard time uh, with the red mist and and being calm and so with those people i might like i would do um um some breathing techniques was was what i do before i pull out onto a run i'll stop and i i just do a single breath in out eyes closed all right i'm centered i'm here let's go and um and i've already memorized the course i know where i'm gonna look i've got a pretty good idea where my where all my breaking and shifting points are going to be for the most part, I kind of let those things find themselves, but um, I concentrate on where I want it, the car to be and what angle I want it pointed at any given point and where I am putting my eyes. And so how many course walks does it take for you to uh, find all those um, key cones, um, all those shift points, all that sort of stuff? Well, I mean, I've got... 15 years of doing this. So, um, I, uh, you know, four to six course walks, if I can get them, you know, a lot of times the, the, the event organization doesn't let that happen, um, uh, just to get everyone in. Right. Uh, but when I went to autocross nationals for the first time, you know, I probably walked that course two dozen times. You know, at, at 11 o'clock at night, the security came and made me leave, you no. know. <laughs> uh, you got this weirdo out here just walking around. <laughs> well, I'm looking at the course of the flashlight. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. I have kind of a tactical question, which may be dumb, but it might be helpful to people. If you're identifying those key cones and your look ahead points, what are you saying or telling yourself in your brain so that when you're going fast, that same cone pops out to you. Do you say like, Oh, key cone one, key cone two. What are you saying? No, I just, I, I don't, there's no voices in my head oh. uh, yet. Um, nice. But uh, I just kind of have like at each point I know when I'm here, I want to just take a second or a millisecond and look at that cone and come back. I don't have to stare at it. I just have to glance at it. And then your brain will yeah. will do all of the necessary geometry to mm -hmm. fill it in and then trusting yourself probably at the end of the day trusting yourself is one of the best pieces of advice mm -hmm. 
And so did you learn all this just by doing, or did you um, have a mentor? Uh, I did, um, I did um, three of the Evolution Performance Driving Schools that travels with the autocross series. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then there's a, a gentleman named Andy Hollis, uh, who's a many times national champion. And um, one of the people that I, if I was in the same place and he was in a car driving and I could watch him drive, I drove, I watched, I would climb to the top of the tallest whatever I could get on when he pulled up the line and I'd watch him. And he used to get so mad at me because I would follow him on his course walks. And he was so sweet in that he didn't like just turn around and tell me to stop following him. Like one day he told a story about how annoying it was. You could hear people's feet shuffling behind you while you're course walking and made sure that I could hear him tell the story. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and so I, I, I followed from much further behind after that. And then, um, uh, and then I started co-driving with Tommy Saunders in the really crazy car called the dragon. And, um, and he was, he was a huge, he was probably the one, the one single person that taught me more than anyone else as a driver. And, um, and I felt like that was the day I finally beat him, uh, was, that was my graduation, I guess, you know? Um, uh. uh, but it was cause the deal was I had to run in the ladies class the first year. And if I won, then maybe I might get to race in the open class the next year. And, um, and there was a lot of conversation about, I was, uh, in my, like my fourth or fifth autocross, this guy rode with me and he's like, it's like, go too far overdrive. And you can't do this in rally cross. It doesn't work. But in autocross, you, there's a reward for this. He's like, overdrive the car, like go too fast, too hard, and then start bringing it back. And that way you could get up to speed faster than if you're always nibbling from the bottom, you may never find 100%. Mm -hmm. but if you find 105, then you can kind of whittle back. Mm -hmm. And if everyone's followed all the rules and the safety guidelines, you're probably not going to hurt yourself or anyone else, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and then... I was still that kind of driver when I got in Tommy's car and he's like, you can't do that. And if you want to drive my car, you have to, you have to be calmer. And so I had to drive bottom up. And even though I knew I could be a faster driver faster, if I kept driving from the top down, but I also knew that if I drove from the bottom up for that year, that it, I would be a better driver mm -hmm. at the end of the year, you know? And, um, and so, yeah, the first national race after, after that year, um, I was in Houston and I set the fastest lap of the event and beat Tommy for the first time and beat his co-driver who got out of his car, smashed his helmet on the ground and threw it in the trash and said he quit because I beat him. Really? <laughs> what? <laughs> hmm. Okay. But, um, he got over it. He came back. He got over it. We're friends. Okay. So you're saying the guy's emotional. <laughs> maybe, maybe. 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 <laughs> oh, man. So you have done all different kinds of racing. You have gone at it from a bunch of different angles. If somebody is interested, let's use rally as an example. If they want to get into rally, what is one thing you would tell them either to do or to do first? Like, if I don't know where to start, what are you going to tell me? And um, it's interesting because autocross gets a bad rap. Okay. And it is the only motorsports environment where you, it is both safe and rewarding to drive 11 tenths. Mm. And if you want to know where the edge is, mm. there's nowhere else that rewards that or gives you a safe environment to do it. You can't go to track day, can't go to the formula one track and do that. You hit a wall, it's $500 a foot. And, and you're banned for life, maybe, you know. Um, if you do rally cross and you mow down a whole bunch of cones over and over again and you're at the back of the pack, it doesn't matter. You don't get a hero run to save the day. Mm -hmm. you know, so there's no reward there. And um, 
Um, the other thing that uh, I think that the autocross does is it teaches you how, how unbelievably important distance is. Mm -hmm. So, you know, getting really close to those cones and, and driving the shortest possible line uh, is huge. And I think it had that kind of background had everything to do with how well I did when I went to hundred acre wood. Mm -hmm. Um, because you may be able to go flying around the corner sideways and not crash your car, but if you don't understand how important it is to be a, an inch or two away from the apex of the corner and not a foot or three, yeah. right. uh, and then over, if you look at, um, in the autocross, they'll say that an inch is a tenth. Mm. And if you're doing 150 miles, you know, thousand corners, an inch is a tenth, you know, it adds up. Yeah. yeah. So. Good advice. Start with autocross. And uh, yeah. And then also I, my advice would, whatever your background is and what your financial situation is, might, might flavor the advice. But for most of us that don't have the silver spoon and we just want to go play and we want to be the best we can, I think that it's worthwhile. It's very worthwhile. Yeah. And autocross is good for kind of tune-ups and touch-ups, just getting yeah. the time. Well, practicing. if you're trying to learn how to set a car up, it's really hard in, in like a rally cross environment because the, the, the earth is so dynamic. Mm -hmm. Like you can make a run, change your car, come out. Now there's a new rut or different run or cones have been moved because of a rut. And now you may not get the feedback you wanted. And like with pavement, the, the ground doesn't change, and if you make changes, you can get real feedback on what effects those changes make. Mm -hmm. And it'll help you learn how to tune your car. You can then take all that information and move it over to the dirt. Mm -hmm. um, you just kind of soften everything up, generally. Mm -hmm. And um, But all the lessons are the same. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's so, all good advice. Yeah, that's great advice. All right, last question. You had all the money in the world and nothing but time. What race would you go to? Oh my God! What single race? A race? Yeah, pick one. Yeah. Just well, me. I've always said that my holy grail is the Dakar. Yeah, okay. that's like a thousand um, races in one, though. That's cheating. Fun. <laughs> I have done the Baja One Thousand. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's um, a little desert. The navigator. I haven't driven it yet. What have you done? Uh, uh, I was a navigator in a class three truck. Oh. And, um, and I was training to do it on a motorcycle when I had my motorcycle accident. Oh, jeez. Mm. Mm. Motorcycles are dangerous. All right. Well, on that uplifting note, thank you for spending this time with us. It has yes. been really great. I'm sure that people learned a lot from it. Tell everyone where they can find you. Aside from Googling Brianne Corn Rally Mexico, which we're going to do, um, where can people find you online? Uh, find us at Lone Star Rally Cross. We have a website and Facebook. And if you want to shoot me a note, you just find me, Green Corn, on Facebook. And if you're in Texas and you want a great rally cross series, follow those directions. Yeah. yeah. And people do fly in, rent, and fly home. Oh, yeah, because oh. you have the rental cars, which is the smartest thing ever. That is a great idea. Yeah, so get a plane ticket. Buy one now. They're really cheap. <laughs> Buy it for later. Buy it for later, please. Yeah. Yes. Well, it's a great awesome. Idea. Thank you, Brianne, as always. Thank you. It was fun.